Welcome or welcome back to the New Levels Coaching Podcast. Remember, we are the coaching podcast that brings the endurance world lots of inspiration and education, so you can quite literally take that and go away and run with it. As always, I'm your host, Lewis Moses, former Team GB international athlete, turn coach and founder of New Levels Coaching. This week, I'm joined by my better half, I should say, <laughs> Gemma Hillier Moses, who is still competing at a very high level, uh, is now turning her attentions more to trail and ultra scene, but is one of the coaches here at NLC and co-founder of New Levels Coaching. Gemma, it's been a while since you've been on the podcast, I feel. I know, I'm back <laughs> after being on every other week. I'm quite excited to be back and in the studio again because it has been a little while. It's like Eminem, guess who's back, yeah. guess who's back. <laughs> we have brought Gemma back this week uh, to talk all things 5K and running your best 5K. Gemma recently set a 5K personal best at the Podium Running Festival in Leicester. Finally. <laughs> Finally, nine years in the waiting, it Gosh. was, I believe. Yeah, it was. And, and I tell you what, it doesn't, well, it makes me feel old because it's nine years ago um but also it doesn't feel like that amount of time since I was running those sort of times so yeah very strange <laughs> well that that's kind of where or, or certainly why we wanted to bring you on because mm -hmm. it shows that uh, it can take time to to break personal bests and when you break personal bests you often think oh I'm gonna smash it again in the very near future and it sometimes does take a while and, and figuring yeah. that out can also take time so we want to touch on uh, what it took to to break that personal best but we really want to draw and both yours and my experiences of the 5k itself. So I personally ran 1347 for 5,000 meters. Uh, I took to 5,000 meters later on in my career. So together we've we've ran pretty reasonable 5k times. Yeah, I would not say. bad. Yeah, not yeah. too bad. Um, but. We have coached a lot of people to run that distance as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and our coaches at New Levels Coaching have also supported a lot of people to break their 5,000 meter personal best. Yeah. So together we want to give the audience and the wider running community a little bit of an insight into, well, what does it take to run your best 5K? And what did it take in this case, in your mm. case? But also, um, what training strategies do we use? Um, is it intentional? Is it sometimes a bit, bit of luck? Is it sometimes part of a process? Uh, is it very much a target? Is it a goal? And we'll touch on all of those things so that people can hopefully get a better understanding of how is it that you can run your best 5K, especially with park run being so popular now and yeah. people targeting park run 5Ks on a regular basis. Yeah. Brill, so to kick us off then, I'm going to backtrack to a few weeks ago. In the pouring down rain and wind at, <laughs> at Leicester, at sunny Leicester, to that podium 5K on the night and that personal best. So give us a bit of an insight, Gemma, into what were your what were your feelings going into that race firstly? And how did you feel like you were performing over that distance in particular? How was training going uh, to give you an understanding of how your performance might be on that evening? Yeah, it was really interesting, actually. So I think we'll go into this specific training but just from a kind of summary point of view I think so I did Valencia marathon in December so the last two races before that 5k was a marathon and a 35k trail race um no no 57k trail race 57k 30, 30 35 miles. miles yeah so um definitely wasn't like you know 5k season last year and I had a couple of weeks completely off and then came back and I think um, I hadn't ran on the road, did a session, no, I had run on the road, did a session on the road um, up until two weeks before that 5k. So all of my training had been on the trails um, and the hills and, and our, the trails near us are quite good. They're runnable. So um, there were some harder sessions, but nothing had been on the flat. Um, so if I was honest, I wanted to run in my head, I did want to run a personal best, but I didn't think I was in the shape to do that. And um, because I had no real evidence until two weeks before when I did that session. And I think after that session, you paced me. And I mean, I could have raced on that night and probably ran a PB because it well, was... Well, conditions were perfect that night yeah, as well. Yeah. yeah, conditions were perfect. I would I didn't think I could run quicker than 320Ks on the road for eight by a K. I was like, there's no way I've not done... Like my sessions were like six minute miling because you're on the hills. So the conversion was like, there's no way I've got any speed in my legs. I can't, and I know it's endurance, but um, I just thought oh, I can't, I'm not in that shape. And then I did that session and I was like, okay, now I get, I, now I believe in Lewis. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm joking. <laughs> but now I believe in the training that we've done. But even the training wasn't specific to run a 5K. The 5K was just part of the process. So it wasn't technically an A race. But once I did that session, I quite, I was quietly confident that I could be around my PB. 
But I also went into it thinking, if I don't hit my PB, I'm not going to be ridiculously disappointed. Um, so that was the mentality going into the race. And actually, I felt really relaxed. I felt I didn't have a target time in mind, but I knew around, you know, 1630 that I would be around that ballpark. Um, so quietly confident, but again, not really focused on the outcome, focused on the pacing. And I think to talk about pacing, and we'll go more into this, I'd actually... I'd done a P- Beacon Hill Park run three weeks before, was it? I think two, uh, weeks, two before. weeks before. I think two weeks before the race, and well, maybe it was three. Yeah, yeah. No, 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 no. Two, two. No, yeah, I can't remember. Three, maybe three. I don't know. Um, but anyway, anyone who knows Beacon Hill Park run, it's got a long climb um, at the start, and then. Uh, still climbing probably for about two miles and then a mile descent and I thought I'd be pretty good at that because I was doing the hills and oh my god it was the <laughs> I said to you it was the hardest race I think I've or not even it wasn't even a race it was just a part run but it's the hardest run I've done like I went too hard up the hill like it was a hill rep and then I managed to run really well down but I ran 1830 for that 5k and I was like there is no way I can run two minutes quicker even if it's on the flat um and we actually converted your because you've run a very good peak at Beacon Hill Park run haven't mm-hmm. you and we converted that if you had the same conversion to flat you would run something like 13 dead. 13 15 yeah 13. which I've, I've run slightly quicker but yeah not in that type of not shape not in that shape yeah. so I had quite a good conversion from the Beacon Hill Park run to 1620 on the road or 1616 now well I'm going to put my coaching hat on here and unpick some of this because I think there's loads of fascinating things to and I'm kind of getting excited excited because you've said a lot of things which I think are relevant and appropriate to unpick at this stage yeah um the first First thing would be you said I didn't really know what shape I was going to be in um, because we'd do, been doing a lot of training on the trails and on the hills and hadn't really been doing the, the flat training. So confidence wasn't sky high because mm. you had no relevance to, to where you might be. Yeah, you had no idea really. So as a coach, I, you know, I'm telling you to trust the process and you, you jokingly said, oh, and then I did one road session and I believed you, like I trusted you <laughs> that, that this is working. Um, this is a really important message for uh, runners who are coached. You, you have to believe in the people who are setting your program. You know, we ask our athletes to do that with us. Believe in us. Like, we do know what we're doing. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, but you then said something else, which I want to draw on that we spoke about or you spoke about it being part of a process so let's backtrack firstly Mm. Valencia Marathon came off the back of an ultra but the ultra was your kind of goal race for the back end of the the autumn winter yeah yeah it was the A goal Valencia was a bit of fun I went there just have a bit of fun see where you were and and it was fun it was a great weekend yeah But then the focus turned, long-term plan, we sat down at the start of the year and said, long-term plan is OCC in the UTMB, which is in August, August 29th, I think it is uh, to be exact, August 30th, maybe. So they, we we then made a decision that you're going to race over 50k as your goal race Mm -hmm. in 2024. So people are probably listening at home now going, well, why the heck are you racing 5k? And I want to t- touch a little bit about that in, in in this discussion right now. But I also want to get your thoughts on this as an athlete. Like when I said to you, right, you've done all those long races and we're going to aim long in August time. However, I want you to run a 5K in March. What was going through your head as an athlete at that point in time? That's a good question. I'm trying to decide if I even thought about it or... <laughs> um. Yeah, I think, because obviously I've done the race now, so I'm like, oh, that's a perfect idea. What a great coach, Lewis. <laughs> Genius. Or a um, fluke, one yeah. of the two. <laughs> um, I guess before I did the road session, I was like, gosh, that's like, I'm going to have to find some speed in my legs. So when you say that, I'm like, how can you, and I should understand this as a coach, but I think when you feel it and do it, 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 it translates a bit differently. Um, so I was like, how can I get into that shape? Because I was, I remember, so another thing to say, when I ran my PB over 5K, 1620 was my PB, it was a completely different training model. Like in terms of everything was on the road, there was no real hills, lots of tempo work on flat and road, um, hilly long runs, but not n- the training was very, very different. So I didn't have any previous confidence to take from that which also shows there's more than one way to do it yeah as well. absolutely um so I think back to your question yeah it was a bit like oh gosh I'm definitely not gonna have the legs to run a 
happy B. But I trust you. And actually, I've done, I understand the whole A race, B race, C race. So really, that 5K wasn't, it turned into an A race because I, well, I got a personal best. It turned into not an A race. It turned into a very good race, but it wasn't an A race. So, no. um, and I'm more than happy to go to races, which I think people, athletes need to be more than happy to go to races and not have that expectation of do, running a PB or running really well if it's not your A race because you're not aiming for it. Brilliant. It's like I teed that up perfectly <laughs> and I didn't, I didn't tee it up, but back to the the C race, the B race, the, the A race. Yeah. So just to clarify for those listeners who've maybe not heard previous pods where we've touched on this, but please go back and listen to them. Um, Jethro spoke uh, heavily about A races, B races and C races and that being one of his big learnings as, as a coach and getting that right. Uh, I took that on board too and, and thought, yeah, that's something I could definitely learn from. You know, we all learn from each other. So the park run, which you mentioned, which was really tough and I was going to come on to this. I'm glad you brought it up. That was very much a C race for us. It was part of the process. We weren't tapering down for it. It was just part of the training week. You went into it on big volume. You were heavy legged. We were never expecting you to run very well there. As in, if you ran well, great. But I knew the reasons why you were going to feel pretty tired. So that was a C race. I would have said personally, um, the the podium 5K was more of a B race. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't a big, big goal for the spring, but it was one that we were going to ease down for a little bit, make sure you're fresh for it and and have a bit of a blast out. So we can call it a B race for a blast out, <laughs> um, but also enjoy being in that setting. So we needed to pay a little bit of attention to it, but we weren't going gun ho for that, that race. The A race being in the spring, the uphill trial, which comes a, a week on Friday, where we said, actually, um, this is an A race goal. But just to be clear on that as well, um, you've never done this before. We're experimenting with it. So we're going to treat it as an A race, as in you're going to taper fully. All the training will be you know, uh, built up towards that race. However, we won't lose sight of the A race later on in the year, which is the OCC. And the priority should always be that long term, that long term aim. Yeah. So. The podium was a B race, but as you said, you got a kind of an A race result from that, Yeah, which was great from my perspective. But what did that tell you as an athlete? What did that give you as or what sort of feelings did you get from that? It was really good. I think it, it showed me I was really happy to run a personal best. And I think it's it was a four second personal best. And I think you you go over the start line and you're like, yes, I've done it. And then a day later, you start to compare to other people. And it's why I was really strong with myself. I was like, comparison thief of joy. You've done a personal best. You're better than you were yesterday. And it's a cracking result that you've waited a long time for. Um, it also showed me that you spoke, and we spoke a lot about training like in the VO2 max zone. In that period, of that block was all about developing your VO2 max. So it showed me we'd develop that because I was in really, really good shape. Um, and that's only going to help me long term when we move into the other blocks of training. Um, and you'll talk more about that. So it showed me that we were in the right zone and we were doing the right training. But also, thirdly, we spoke about on this podcast a few when I was on last, um, I had a race in January, February, which is the Charmwood Hills that I um, really struggled with missing because I had a cold and um, I felt, you know, really poorly and we had to pull out of that race and it felt like a big thing. And I spoke about how the week after, you know, mentally, I just felt like I was in a slump and hard to get out. And I had a few people message me feeling the same with a lot of illnesses. But what it shows is only a month later, because it was March, how that can change. So you can have a week off or a week of doing nothing and you can still run really well. And I think we've spoken about it recently about getting to the start line, 100% healthy, 90% fit is better than getting there feeling super, super fit, but carrying lots of illnesses, niggles and injuries. So when you look back at your training, you you will miss things in your training block. Like my training block wasn't perfect towards that 5K, um, but I got a great result from it. But nothing's ever perfect. No. And, and that's what I was trying to emphasize when it was my decision to, to pull you out of the Charmwood Hills race. I could see you weren't comfortable with it, but I could see you weren't right. And I've made that mistake in the past where I've let you make that decision as an athlete. And I think sometimes I need to be stronger as a coach and say, actually, you know what? That's It's not the right decision right now because it's a C race. The, the Charmwood Hills was a C race. Why would we risk 
go and race in a C race when we know you're not right. Yeah. Why would we put yourself uh, in that environment to go and race when you're not right, which is potentially going to have knock-on effects on the other races that we've got coming up? So it was the right decision to do that. And as you say, you got a positive result at podium off the back of that. Um, but what I would say as well, touching back on, on something you said, was it was a very planned phase of training. So I'd spoken to you about certain things that we wanted to work on early in the plan. And I felt like one of your strengths is uh, your your VO2 max, your 5K sort of speed, your 10K speed. It's it's something that you're good at that a lot of other trail runners maybe can't run at that intensity, that speed. So I thought, you know what? I want to develop that. I want to tap back into it and make sure it is where we want it to be. Like I want it to be as good as it's ever been. That yeah. was my philosophy as a coach. So in this phase from sort of, end of January until March, we're going to do quite a lot of VO2 max work. Now, what does that look like for, for the audience sat at home? Well, um, hill reps fell into it. So at one, two, three minute hill reps and off, off good recovery, like one to one recovery, we would describe that as um, a lot of some work on the road, which we, we layered in right at the end yeah. as well, just to really kind of sharpen the tools as well. But we did do a lot of that work on, on the hills. That was obviously combined with some threshold work as well that was very um, specific. However... We are not spending too long in that phase. We're now moving out of that phase, even though you've developed that, because um, you're going to go to the longer stuff. But if we go to your A race goal in the spring, which is the, the uphill trial at Skidor, we know that VO2 Max is going to play a big part of, of the demands of that event. So I, as a coach, also had it in my mind that, well, we need to develop VO2 Max because it's going to play a big part in Skidor. But just to um, enlighten people with what you'll be doing in Skidor, what do we also know about Skidor? What type of race is it? And what does the environment look like? Well, it just goes straight uphill. <laughs> One of our coaches, Sam Stabler, did it. He said it's the worst race he's ever done in his life. <laughs> so then, and it's on trail. But let's, let's, so let's take those three things because I think they're all, they're all fascinating points. So it's on trail. So where have we spent a lot of the time? Trail, yeah. Trails. It's uphill. So where did we spend the VO2 max work? Where was the, the majority of that VO2 max was done? Uphill. Uphill. Yeah. And we know that it's possibly the worst race you'll ever do in your life, as in feeling, <laughs> according know, to Sam. I don't know Beacon Park Run was. <laughs> but so then why do we put things like Beacon Park yeah. Running and Hard Hill Reps? It's to emulate that same feeling of, oh my God, this is horrific. Yeah. And what we did after Beacon Park Run, which you've not said to the audience, is you did the Park Run, you said it was horrific, and we did some Hill Reps after, which were even more horrific. Yeah. Yeah, I think as, I think going back to the 5K as well, there was some learnings that came from doing things like the Beacon Hill Park Run and looking at sessions. So I think to run your best 5K, I would, so mentally for number one, I would go into a B, a C or an A race exactly the same. I think for me as an athlete, taking the pressure off, not having a specific time goal, but knowing what sort of shape I'm in helps me to perform the best. And that's, I would go into that, whether it's I'm trying to qualify for something or I'm trying to get a really good time. That's That works for me and that's super important. I think more people could be like that rather than just naming a time and then setting yourself up to fail because you've got that time barrier there. But also ones if you're running a lot quicker, do you then panic because you're feeling good and you you know how that how that works um number two is I felt like I paced the beacon part run badly I went off too hard and it hurt like hell and it was a hang on type of race and I knew that I can't make that mistake again I ran podium and I paced it really really well I came mm -hmm. through on each lap and each mile and the amount of people I passed in the last 2k was was really a confidence booster for me but also the amount of people that just went on off too hard so pacing mindset going into a race is super important but pacing is probably your most important thing because it would have been I was in an A race I was a little bit worried about being in the A race because it'd be too fast because I didn't know what shape I was in um but the amount of people that you pass on those last couple of k because they're just dying a death is is such a confidence boost when you're moving through so I think there was learnings from in training or in racing if you've had an experience where you've gone off too fast don't bloody make the same mistake again like learn from it and I'd pride myself on being 
really good at pacing in races, but I was just getting into that thing of having to go off a bit harder. Mm -hmm. And that beacon part run taught me a lesson. I learned very quickly. And I believe that that's why I ran my personal best. Whereas I could have gone, if I went off harder, I don't think I'd have run my personal best because I'd just died because it was tough conditions as well. So that also means that you need a bit more for the last couple of laps when it's teeming down with rain and gale force wind. Well, let's let's touch on that point because I think it's a really good take home message for people who are, who are listening. The, the other reason, the other discussion we had were off the back of the part run where you definitely got your pacing wrong because I was in there and I was running up the hill with you and I was thinking... This is this is too hard. I was hill repping, wasn't I? I? I, could, I could just tell from the breathing, like yeah. being next to you. I, I, I could sense, I was thinking, God, if she can keep this up, it's really impressive. Um, but having done that course and knowing what it was like, I was thinking, this feels a little bit too hard right now. But it was a big learning, and but also it was a good training effect as well. And it was a C race. It, it was just part of the process. So yeah. I said to you straight after, look, I know you didn't get it right, but that's a really good training effect. You know, you'd have, you'd have got something from that and you'll, you'll progress because of that. But the other thing with the pacing, you said I was in the A race, um, meaning the, not the A race goal. You were in the A race on the night, just yeah. to clarify for people tuning in, which was the elite race, the top race of the night for, for women. You're worried about the pace at the front end and you knew you wouldn't be able to, to go with that pace. So you've got to make a decision to trust yourself with your own pacing strategy. But also, again, putting my coaching hat on here, the reason I have that discussion with you before and say don't get caught up in that is because I know that we haven't done too much work above that sort of pace or that intensity either. So that if you go and run too hard in the first kilometre, you're not going to be able to tolerate what you've just done and you're not going to be able to sustain it. So the pace would be way too hot for you. Your best strength was almost your strength, which yeah. is why our strategy was like, look, we've done a lot of stronger work. We've done a lot of threshold work and we've worked on some VO2. Your best strategy here is to try and finish strong. But if you get carried away at the first part of this race, you're going to be in trouble. And we knew that, we had evidence of that from the part run. Yeah, yeah. And I do think the pacing is make or break for a lot of people. I think, I think it's, yeah, it's being patient. And I think people are just not patient enough. They run with their ego or they they just don't run with their brain earlier on and they just get carried away. And I think that's why a lot of people don't necessarily achieve the results in races that they want to. Because if your training's going really well, like your fitness is there and actually it's the brain and the mind that you're using while racing. Like you have to use it. Yeah, <laughs> like it's not do. like a necessarily like a 1500 meter tactically because, you know, I wasn't at the front of that race. You, the girls are running 15 minutes. Like I have to, I'm not in the race for first, second or third. I'm in a race against myself and the other people, but I have to use my brain every lap. I can't just switch off and let my legs run um, because it's being smart and sensible and making the decisions at the right time. Um, and the more you practice that in training and the more you expose yourself to that in racing, that you'll get that aha moment where you're like, ah, oh, that's what they've been saying for the last two years. And then it, and then it pays off. <laughs> The, a lot of people were going to be able to relate to that because you've just said you're in an elite race, but you weren't, weren't racing for first, second, and third. You weren't really racing for a position. I think you finished like 31st or yeah. in, a, in a stacked field. Yeah. Like, I think there was about 70 to 80 people in the race. First vet 35. First V35 <laughs> as well. I God. only got 20 good vouchers. I deserve more than that being 35. <laughs> yeah, sports shoes, come on. No, Go no, ahead. no, thank you. It was great. <laughs> no, it was, a, it was a fantastic event. I don't know if the team tune into this podcast. I hope they do. I hope you're listening. Um, I think it was a brilliant event. I think there needs to be more of that here in the UK. So kudos to you, team. You put on something very special. I know you didn't get the weather on the night for the air races, which again is something we can touch on about. Maybe there was potential to go a little bit faster yeah. in the right conditions. Um, but just back to that point I'm making is a lot of people will be sat here, maybe going into marathon season right now, and they know they're not going to be at the front of that race. But it's the same as you. Yes, you're up in the 30s and, and competing within that race, but you've got to compete against yourself first and you've got to have your strategy and be willing to stick to that strategy. But then deeper in the race, you've got to be able to respond to what's going on around you and compete against those around you. Like feed off the energy of I'm going through the field here. That's really positive. Yeah. And use that energy to help propel you forward, which is, is what you did so well. And the other thing was that I didn't wear a watch. So yes, this is you an didn't. interesting yeah, yeah. concept. So I never wear a watch for 5K or 10K. Um, I do wear it for a marathon, but I'm 
considering in the future not to because and, and I think there is a place for it in the marathon absolutely but there's a place of managing how you use the watch in the marathon but 5k I think it shows that you don't need the watch if you learn and we talk about this a lot learning to run to feel and the trails and running on hills just help you do that because there is no session that I've done on the trails and hills where I look back and really analyze paces. I don't. When I'm running, I don't even have pace. I just have the time and it beeps at me or you shout time. Um, and I think that's that's such a nice thing for the mind so that when you go into a race, I was actually more in tune with my body than I've ever been because I didn't need to know what that first lap split was. Like I didn't even, you don't know because the clock's not at mm. the K split. So throughout that whole race, I had no idea what pace it was. I just had to do it to feel. And the fact that you can, I progress it, my times progressively got quicker because you were able to look at the chip timing um, across the mat each lap and it got progressively quicker without even looking at the watch. So it shows what you can do with the, with the kind of body feel connection when you're running. I, and I would go a little bit deep with that and say, Yes, the feel, yes, the body, yes, the understanding, but also the practice. So if we backtrack a couple of weeks to that key session that you spoke about, eight by a K on the road, um, to give people an insight, it was done on the road, it was intentional session, we were setting it up, eight by one K off, 90 seconds recovery. Um, usually people can operate at around about 5K pace or intensity for that session. So it's a, it's a key session and we set it up as a key session. But most importantly, guess what we also did on that night is you went off in control around 320, maybe just inside per kilometer, which we thought was similar effort to what you would do on the night in a race, yeah. maybe 315. But in training, that's going to feel, you know, a little bit harder because it always does in training. And then every rep of that eight times 1K got faster until we finished down at somewhere like 302, 303 for the last kilometer, which I know you were surprised at. Yeah. But the mm. pacing in that session was intentional mm. to set it up, to practice doing that so that when you come to race day, that is ingrained in you. This is how we do it. And I would say that is a key message to people listening who want to run their best 5K. You need to practice your pacing strategy and you need to get used to it. Yeah. Because how you do everything is how you do anything or how you do anything is how you do everything. Yeah. And if you're doing, if you're going out too fast in training all the time and that isn't your strategy come race day, you're not going to be able to undo it because the body's used to it, the mind's used to it. And I'm sure you'd agree with that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think it's so important. So the title of this podcast is, you know, running your best kit, running your best 5K, how to run your best 5K. Oh, I'm kicking your microphone <laughs> as we go, if you're watching Just on YouTube. Going. But, um, you know, I find one of the biggest problems we have when, when people come on board with us coaching and they ask, you know, I've got a target to run sub 30 minute 5K or sub, it's always a round number, sub 20 minute for 5K, sub 25 minutes for 5K, it's always that round number. Um the first thing that I look at is the pattern of when they have, in the past, tried to achieve their best 5K. And what we tend to see as coaches is that they haven't intentionally planned to run their best 5K. They've ran a good 5K and then they just keep trying to run faster and faster and faster. Yeah. And their, um, I guess their strategy with that is to just to enter more 5Ks or go and do park run every week. Now, I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with that as a strategy if you are wanting to be sociable, if you want to be involved in the community, if you want to be regularly going to races and being around people, and that's really good and that's part of your goals and your aims and your ambitions, then that is fantastic. But if you're trying to target specifically the 5K and run your best 5K, I don't think, in fact, I'm going to say it isn't the best strategy. No, and also, I absolutely agree with you, it isn't the best strategy. And also, you can go to those things like I coach Joe and Alice, and she, we will use races as part of training, but she won't race, she won't go and race the race. Like, park your ego and go and just run them as like an easy run. Like, I've done so many park runs as easy runs that I do not have a problem going to park run and easy. And also, if you're going to like, if you're going to race, say, a park run every time or going to a 5k every weekend, you can't get up mentally for every race. Like, you can't, it, you just can't do it every weekend. It won't feel like a race anymore. It'll just feel like a, 
a thing that you do every weekend that you're trying to run faster. And and I think that's the beauty of racing is that build into it, that taper down. That and, and that the, we haven't even touched on the taper of how important that is into your key race. But I think that build, that taper, that different feeling about a race is super important to help get the best out of you. Well, we will touch on the taper because I know a lot of people are coming up to marathons in the in the this weekend's Manchester, Monday's mm. Boston, the week after's London. There's lots of other marathons as well going on around the world and here in the UK. And everyone is familiar with the taper when it comes to marathon. I don't think everybody really understands the taper into short distances, particularly the, the 5K. Yeah. And there is still a taper process to that too. Um, but touching back on on something that you just said there about when when we're looking to run our best 5K, like we can we can target it. But if we are using races in the process or going to park run every week, I think you then have to have a real understanding of why you are there. Yeah. Why am I here? But the other big thing around that is if you do go there and race every week, what we tend to find is people get good um, increases in performances and then they plateau. And the reason for that is because the training around those races starts to suffer because you're not able to train as effectively outside of those races because you're racing every week. And if you want an example of how to do it, you often have to search at the top end of the sport and you will never see people racing every week, week in, week out throughout the year. So they're showing that it's not the best way to do it. And the reason it's not the best way to do it is because you neglect the training that you should be doing in order to run your best race. Yeah. So... With that in mind, and if people are there listening going, okay, well, I do want to go to a park run every Saturday, mm. or I do want to go to an event every week, and I do want to race, um, or, or I certainly want to be part of it, what are the strategies for those people? What could they be thinking? How could they use those events? You've mentioned easy running at park run. What else could they be doing? Yeah, I think it's easy running or, you know, going to cheer people on. You still get the same dopamine hit and the like the, the fun side of it, volunteering. Um, but I think it's I think it's just having that self awareness of what are your goals and you know, if your goal is to run your best five K, then just don't go and run something fast every weekend. Focus on the training and that period and that block that's gonna help you get there. And I think that's the it's a bit of self awareness, bit of ego check. Um, it doesn't matter what you what you run on those weekends. Who cares? Like I you know, I didn't race well, I raced before podium five K, I did one park run and then the podium five K and that was two races in the last four months. And I love racing. Like, I don't want to just train. I want to race. But when you understand the system and you understand how your training set up, hopefully that should help you be okay with those decisions as well. And let's pick a few examples here because it's a really good point. You can go and cheer, volunteer. You can go and marshal. You can still be involved in that community. But when we have athletes who say, no, nope, I've got races in the calendar. Um, you know, I've got... I want to run this 5K on this date, but three weeks before I've got a 10K, um, two weeks before I've got a half marathon, uh, and the week before I might go to park run. Okay, so there's there's four weekends then. On the fourth weekend, I want to run my best 5K. Yeah. And I'm definitely doing them. I'm entered into all those races. But at this point in time, we're about 10 to 12 weeks out. So we've got plenty of notice as a coach. What conversations could we have with them about those races, in particular the 10K, the half marathon and part run, the consecutive weeks leading into the 5K. How can we still make sure that they do peak at that 5K? Yeah, I think it's asking it's asking them which ones are their A races and so making sure the 5K actually is what they want to do. Because we've got to remember as anyone we coach, it's their program and it's their life. And that's super important as coaches. So it's like, what are your goals? We can give you advice and help guide, but let's let's collaborate on that. Um, let's just not say, oh, I think you this is definitely what you're done doing. They're like, oh, don't want to do that. So like figuring out what's their A, B and C goals and then looking at the training process or so looking at the 12 weeks leading into that and where those races sit and saying, I think it's understanding your athlete because I can say to certain athletes, go here and do a progression run so run 10 miles easy last three miles 
start to progress, start to push that pace on slightly. Or I can say, go to this race and just do it as an easy run and they will. But there are certain athletes that need a lot more understanding and kind of encouragement to stop them from doing that. So I think it's using races. Races can be really good to use as tempo runs as long as people keep a lid on it um, because often you can feel a little bit better in them um, at that at that same pace. And I just think it's being smart about it and also practicing the certain things that you could practice in those races, like the pre, I guess, um, your preparation into the race. Um, but it's making sure that the athlete understands that you're not going to taper into all of those because the training is also super important around it. Yeah, some really good points. Like, could you go to a 10K and do it as a tempo run, mm. for example? Or actually, do because the 10K is a bit further away, do you want to run that 10K a bit harder and use it as a uh, a C race? Or you're going to train through it, but you're going to use that as the training session that week. But we are going to go quite hard. The, the half marathon, well, could that be used as your long run if you're willing to keep a lid on it and, and control things and you know not go too hard? And we talk a lot about running to feel. Yeah. But I think as coaches, this is where it's really important to also have that open mind of, at some point, runners will respond well to running to split as well. And we've done yeah. a really good podcast on that with, with Matt Long, running to feel, running to pace, running to split. And if you know you've got an athlete who you tell them to run to feel and they're going to struggle to do that in that race, why not give them a split to, to run to and say, look, the purpose of today is to go and run easy. We, were, we agreed that 10, 10 weeks ago, which I 100% agree with, by the way, it's about knowing your athlete but also building a relationship with them and understanding what they want from it i think that's priority number one but saying some 10 weeks ago we agreed this is in the plan you're going to go there you're going to run easy we know now from your training that your easy run sits at you know nine minute mile in um so we'd like you to go there run at nine minute mile and you know what have a bit of fun in the last mile and, and pick up the last mile like yeah. having that conversation but it's not being afraid to have that conversation but if we go full circle and go back to the trust element this is where the athlete really has to trust the coach yeah. and and get that understanding. And then the athlete, sorry, the coach has to trust the athlete that they can go and execute it. Yeah. And I think when you were saying run, some athletes respond to run into um, splits and run into feel, if you were to tell me don't go faster than easy run pace during that if I was, if I was say for in a race and you were like, don't go fast and easy run pace, I would need to look at my watch to make sure I'm not going faster. And that's a really good barrier to have. But I think if it's not, if it's working, don't change it. So if you're an athlete that loves the split, loves looking at it and that you're producing the race results you want and you're feeling good and you're, you know, you're getting personal best or at least achievements that you want to achieve, then keep, keep doing that. It's when it's like starts to become a problem and looking at splits all the time is making someone anxious or they're, you know, they're not just, they're not running their best way and they're not, they're not processing it. They're not um, dealing with it very well. And same with running to feel if they're all over the place because they've never, been in tune with the body and the splits were working for them why change it so like you said it's all about working with the athlete trialing and testing different things and seeing what sticks and what works because what works for me won't work for you yeah. and vice versa absolutely and, and again using that as an example like the feel a split you could the 5k the week before park run and you know someone says i still want to go to park run and and, and run that you could based on your strategy the week after, if you're going to race to split as well the week after, you could say at part run the week before, well, I'll tell you what, you know what, I want you to run like 30 seconds or, or a minute slower than per mile for the first split. Then I want you to run 30 seconds a mile slower, roughly, give or take. And then the last mile, I'd like you to do at race pace. So like you, you do like a progression run, as you mentioned. Yeah. But you might have somebody where you just say, I'd like you to do a progression run. I'd like you to start at five out of 10, progress to seven out of 10, finish at eight, nine out of 10. Yeah. And some people will get that as well. That's the beauty of coaching. Yeah. That's the beauty of runners. Everybody's different. Yeah, we're not a textbook. Like if nope. you, if this is why coaches exist, because you work with a person, you work with their lifestyle, you work with them mentally and physically, and we are also different and unique. Yeah, 100%. So you've got to race week then. Yeah. It's 5K a week and... Um, Hopefully your coach has already planned in your taper or you've had that discussion with them. But again, this this person is is not being coached. They've they've been setting their own plan and they then think, right, it's race week, but I'm just going to crack on my normal week and then expect to run my best 5K at the weekend. Is it likely that that will happen or do they need to think about changing things up a little bit? So you absolutely need to think about the taper going into your A race. And just to give you an example, we made a few decisions. So I've been tapering to races since I was like... 
probably like seven, 15, 16, 17. So it's quite a natural thing. Um, but I have heard even elite athletes or, or sub, sub elites say, I've got to still do these certain things in a taper and getting quite specific about it. And I remember Crammy, Steve Cram, saying that before one of his major races, he had two full days off. All his major races. All of his major races. Yeah. He had two full days off. Now, if you tell some people that we know to have two full days off, they would panic and be like, I can't do that. Mm. But the reality is nothing in those three days before is massively going to help you in terms of it. it it's going to help you if you rest. It's not going to help you if you keep cracking on and doing certain high, harder sessions two days, three days before. Yeah, the biggest benefit it will have, if anything, is just mental. It's it, Physically, you're not trying to really achieve anything at no. that stage. You're trying to just rest and recover. Exactly. And you want to keep your legs moving and you want to you want to feel fresh but I I would say personally doing anything hard in the three days before other than some strides is not that beneficial because it's not going to help your fitness and performance strides being like faster runs like what we call like controlled sprints where you're looking to fire things up bit of neural facilitation there just neuromuscularly fire it up so that things aren't shutting down and again maybe feel a little bit better just to spin the legs as we say before race they would, you'd usually do that a day or two out most cases yeah absolutely so from my perspective I'd been doing a lot of my runs on hills I'd had a lot of elevation in the week so that week start I did a hilly run on the Sunday because again it wasn't an A race but if it's an A race you might want to think about that run being on less elevation if you do hills um, and then the rest of the week I was like I'm not going I'm not going to Beacon I'm not going to um, outwards I'm doing it all pretty much on flat near us so I made a decision to take the elevation out and then just run on the normal flat trails that we run on um, and then I would have done a session on the Tuesday which was more like a taper session so I remember doing it with Chris and Ben and it was like a mile and then some 400s but I literally so I sat behind Ben on the um, mile and I was like oh this actually the pace felt um, the pace was quick not too quick but it was like tempo high end tempo quick but I felt really relaxed and then literally I sat behind Chris for the 12 400 so I did and I didn't push anything like ask him I was like Chris I'm not I'm not taking one I'm sitting on you that's just <laughs> that's just how it goes so again in that last session not feeling like I needed to leave everything there I was just happy to get it done tick it off I didn't care about the times and then it was really like easy run rest day shake out run um, and then race. And the the one thing into the taper I do do, it was an evening race, I do do a 20 minute um, jog on the morning of the race because I think that helps just to loosen the body and settle settle the nerves. Personal preference, you figure yeah. it out over time. Yeah. 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 Well, Chris said to me, he said he thought you were just sat on him because you like his backside. Which, uh, <laughs> is, um, you know, he wasn't, he wasn't sure whether he was just chilling out a little bit. But I think it's a good, it's a good point. I used to view that as why would you want to leave everything in training mentally and physically on race week when you don't just need the body to show up physically, you need the mind to show up as well and be willing to go deep. That's how I used to look at it. Mm. Um, as everybody knows, when you run a hard 5K, whether you run a hard mile, a 5K, 10K, it all hurts the same. It just hurts a different way. So a marathon hurts for a little bit longer. It starts less and then you know gets a little bit more intense the longer you go. Uh, 5k hurts a lot for probably about half of it and you know a mile hurts for less time than that but it hurts potentially even more for a shorter period of time the pain is in a bit more intense because of the flooding of lactic acid and then 400 is even worse than that so the pain is like has got similarities but what it has a similarity in is the mind in all of those situations is going to have to go deep and you need the mind to be fresh and ready to do that because if it's not, it won't go deep. And and there's, there are the supporting literature on this about if we suppress ourselves mentally, if we're stressed, if, yeah. if we take that stress into a race, we just can't go as deep. We can't push ourselves to the same uh, to the same extent as what we can if we're feeling good and we're mentally fresh. So even those things to think about in taper as well is like how are you relaxing. How are you switching off? How are you giving yourself your time? Go into it physically ready and mentally ready. That's how I used to view it. Yeah, and I think that's right because one uh, A race approaching can be stressful for people. So if you find racing stressful and you get nervous because you're constantly thinking about times and the outcome goals, you really need to work hard over months and years to try and focus on process goals because 
that race week you don't we, we all get nervous and that's really important like nerves are important it means you care but if it's becoming kind of over consuming you and becoming a problem then like you say that stress book it's going to get full the likelihood is the rest of your life has a bit of stress in it so add that all together and you've just not got a clear head to race so I think it was like when we were in Morsi and we did an interview with Edwina Sutton and you know it's not not everyone's going to be able to do this but you can do this mindset wise is like look at the dials in your life and when you are coming to an A race you might need to dial back other things in your life while you dial up your training and focus and racing um, and you can't do that all year round because people are you know people are juggling families kids work life but but mentally you can start to train the brain to think differently and absorb things differently because like otherwise you say you're you're getting to your own race and then everything feels stressful your stress book is up here you don't have the headspace to perform no and I really like that analogy that Edwina gave us in in Marzine about you know the, the dialing up the dialing down mm. certain aspects and and you can use the buckets as well I think Matt Matt's used that on a previous podcast about dividing things up into buckets and I see the same with how we manage our lifestyle it's important to do that and I'd say if you're picking a, a key race that you want to target also look at where that falls on your calendar you know it's probably not a good idea to put it in like a really busy time period where stress levels are going to be high or like certainly don't put it the day after like a big event like a wedding or something like that yeah. it sounds basic but you know sometimes people do have to think more long term about where where it is there might be an ideal event but it might clash with something so it's sometimes good to look at that calendar and think well where's best for me when when am I going to perform best um, um and also factoring in like the seasons as well you know there's the 5k in March is is like a good idea the weather yeah. wasn't particularly great but you know 5k in January outside it's a strong chance you're not going to get the weather for illness. that sort of thing it's why yeah. a lot of people yeah illnesses are rife as well around Christmas and people breaking up from schools and those sort of things so sometimes planning that as well and looking at the seasons and when it might be better to, uh, to, to run your best your best race as well as the location as well which can can play a part because one thing we haven't mentioned podium was obviously flat as a pancake um which well, is why it's slight fast. incline slight down downhill <laughs> nothing, nothing compared to what you had been doing yeah, on true. the trails which again you know you purposely set that up you want to go on a fast course you want to go in a fast race because you're aiming to run your fastest race so people at home you know have a look at where those fastest races are have a look at the course profile don't go and try and run your fastest ever 5k on a course that has a 100 meter hill in it it just doesn't make sense yeah but you could use that course for a bit of training or if you're suited to those courses like we spoke about me on a marathon potentially being suited to hilly undulating courses so it's also about understanding you as an athlete as well um, I wanted to come back to ask you about the taper side of things because mm -hmm. I think, again, like we said with the training, there's this perception that your training has to be perfect and linear and that every, you have to tick everything off in order to get a personal best or your best performance. And that, that's absolutely not the case. And in the taper that you did for not just 5K races, but for your other races, those of you who trained with you will know that you always struggled on that Tuesday before and likely didn't finish the session. Um, and somebody would perhaps feel really tired in their session or struggle with their session. And they would start to panic because they'd be like, if I feel like this now in four days time, how the hell am I turning this around? Mm -hmm. um, because part of what you want from that Tuesday session is to feel good and get a bit of confidence. But the likelihood is that's not going to happen every time. So how did you, like, what was your experience in that taper week? And then how did you deal with it mindset wise? Yeah, the taper week was always an interesting one for me. I always expected it to feel quite bad. Um, I just used to see it as my, my view on it. And I'm not saying there's any science to this, there may well be, but my view on it was my mind and body knows that I'm racing at the weekend or whenever that race is. So for the next four or five days, my mind is going to tell my body to do as little as it possibly can so that it can perform at its best come race day. So it was almost like my mind used to shut my body down and go into protection mode and say, I don't want you to do this tonight because I want you to save your energy for when it when it really matters. And I just learned to accept that. But in terms of confidence, I've, I've learned as a coach that um, some athletes that really dents their confidence, it never used to dent my confidence. And I'll, I'll tell you why, because 
I don't believe one session dictates um, where you are in your you, with your fitness or um, how you're performing as an athlete. I th- I believe it's a longer period of time. So I used to take all my confidence from either previous races or previous training sessions. If I was in shape, I was in shape. Mm-hmm. If I went to the Tuesday night and I just wasn't quite on it, it doesn't mean I'm out of shape. It just means I'm having a bad night or I wasn't quite up for it. And I just learned to accept that quite quickly. But also the evi- I, I also looked for like clarification or evidence. I seen a pattern that I'd have a bad session or drop out on the Tuesday and it would be followed by a good race. So I think then I kind of looked for it a little bit. So much so, if the session was going really well on the Tuesday, I'd almost intentionally pull myself out and say, hang on a sec. Like, I'm ready. I'm ready yeah, to go. I'm yeah. ready. And, and I'd learned that and heard that from like Seb Coe and Peter Coe that he'd done something similar. I'm not comparing myself <laughs> to Seb Coe here, by the way. But what I am saying to, to you, everyone at home, is we can learn from the elites. And I was learning that point from the best in the business or one of the best in the business from the past and, and saying, well, actually, that's what they used to do as well. So I'm going to pull myself out. And the purpose of it for me was just, again, back to the point of, I just want to be ready to go on race day. Now, I guess for a lot of people, and I had these situations as well, there were certain times when I knew training hadn't gone well. I knew that I wasn't quite in the shape I wanted to be, and I had a race coming up, and I didn't perform well in the races. And I, I had to accept that. In hindsight, would I have done those races? I think I always probably would just because I wanted to see and you have to give yourself a chance and sometimes you can't You can't have an excuse and say I can't just not do it. But were the races that I stood on the start line where I shouldn't shouldn't have? Yeah, there absolutely was. You know, shin pain, starting on the, standing on the start line, running a race, not quite getting the best out of myself and then finding out you've got a stress fracture afterwards but I couldn't pull myself out of the race. I, I shouldn't have been on the start line. Mm. So I think it's a really important message for people. Like you've got to know your body. You've got to understand yourself, but you've also got to know when it's not right and not be afraid to make an important decision of saying there's going to be another day. Yeah. And I guess not injury wise, but say you hadn't done, you'd missed a block of training because of illness or family and you're feeling healthy, um, but you're not fit and you're not in a place to go. Instead of going into that race and being disappointed that you haven't ran your best, it's being aware and saying, if you can cope with going into that race and being okay with the outcome, go and run the race. Change it from an A goal to a C goal. If you know that your world's going to fall apart because you don't run your best race, even though you know your all of your training has been disrupted, then don't do the race because it's going to hurt more. Um, so, you, so again, you've got to know your mind and you've got to know how you feel about certain situations of whether you should be in those or not. Yeah, a hundred percent agree. To to wrap us up, I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit because you just put me on the spot there about my tape. I, know, I thought we were, you were asking. I was talking a lot about me, and I was like, "Well, you ran a much faster 5k." <laughs> it's all about you, Gemma, <laughs> as I always say. Um, so, what I'm going to ask you is um, one bit of advice, probably training advice, to people listening in, um, which is either like a training myth or a misconception or just general advice as to how to run your best 5k but something we've not mentioned <laughs> in the podcast today so have a think i'll go first That's so that you killer, can have a think yeah. so i can give you the example we've mentioned a lot <laughs> we have but my my biggest one i think which we haven't touched upon and why i want to mention this and give you time to think of a, a, a diamond in the rough as well okay. is people think to run the best 5k that they need to focus on speed work and i'm telling you now that will not result in your best 5K. I'm not saying that you shouldn't do speed work. I want to be very clear on that. But the 5K is a predominantly aerobic event, which means you need to be aerobically strong. And the biggest mistake I see people make when they run the 5K is they think they don't have to run long. They think they don't have to do long reps. They think that all their training should be fast and that all their training should be at 5K pace or faster. I'm going to go out on a bit of a whim here and say you should probably have one session per week at 5k pace or intensity or slightly faster and not much more. And that's speaking from experience. Now, the top, top athletes may dip into it twice a week or they might have it be on a 10 day, 11 day cycle or something like that. But what I will say is, and I'm not telling people to do this, it's all relative. When I ran my best 5k, 
my long run sat at 18 miles, which goes to show you, I'm not saying go out and run 18 miles, by the way, to, to run your best 5K. That's not what I'm saying. What I am saying is it shows you how aerobic my training was. And I felt super strong when I ran that 5K PB. However, I wouldn't have ran a 1500 meter PB when I ran my 5K PB. I didn't run a 1500 meter PB, which tells you I wasn't as fast as I had ever been, but I was stronger than I'd ever been. And that's why I made the jump. And you were training for the the right distance. I think that's key. When you try and yeah. train for everything, you're not going to get results in everything. No. You're only going to get the results in the thing that you're specifically training for potentially. So my, my big yeah. two my big two would be target a race and don't just race every week. You know, look at that big A goal. Yeah. Plan those goals. My other one would be yes, you need to run fast. I'm not saying you don't. Um but don't underestimate the power of the long aerobic work. Yeah. This is a super hard question because I feel like we've covered everything really well. I'm like, what else is there to cover? Um, two things, I think. This is super hard. <laughs> two <laughs> things. <laughs> Standard me, isn't it? I was say you. Can't think of anything, but I've got two. <laughs> you talk more That's than it. me. Um, the first thing is... I think that people neglect rest and recovery. Actually, it's all tied to one. So I think we've spoke about pacing, mindset, training. So I'm going to talk about rest and recovery because that is where all your adaptations occur. So if you're if you're doing everything hard all the time and intense, both physically and mentally, you just won't recover and you won't um, absorb that training that gets you ready to run your best races. So rest and recovery also, it basically means looking after your body. So looking after those stress levels, looking at your sleep. And I know that's difficult, especially for people like who are running that are new parents, you're not going to be able to sleep your eight hours a day like we would. But it's still super important to think about, okay, well, if that's not the case, or you're not sleeping, what what actually needs to be removed, what needs to be dialed down, what needs to be dialed up. Um, alongside that, also looking after your body. So if you need, you know, if you need regular massage, chiropractor or physio appointments, making sure in the build up to those races, the timing is right with them. I think people neglect their body and then they do a lot of training, then they get to two weeks before and that's where the body starts to break down. So I've had that with myself before. I've done big blocks of training, everything feels great. And then two weeks before I'm like, all these tightnesses have come out of nowhere. Whereas actually, if I'd have been really good with getting my appointments in, say chiropractor or physio, then I would have each time like looked after the body and then been a better place two weeks before your race. Because otherwise it just all builds up. Um, and around that rest and recovery is also about nutrition and food. So if you don't fuel your body with enough carbohydrates and now specifically protein, we need a lot more protein than we think we need, especially as um, as an aging athlete and we're all aging. Um, but that protein is super important for recovery. So it is making sure that you get 30 minutes post-exercise, getting in that um, protein and carbohydrate, however you want to get it in, but also making sure you're having nutritious meals and fueling the body properly. Because as a coach, I think, um, and as an athlete, we can't progress training or we can't, you're not going to function as well without that without that good nutrition. Um, and that's something I do look at as a coach is, uh, am I going to progress your training while I'm looking at all of this? And if all of this is good or moving in the right direction, then we can look at doing that. If it's not, you're just going to break down. So there's no point anyway. Um, so I think people need to recognize that even more as a runner and going towards their goals. Yeah, it's a, a really good point. It's when, like you say, that training is absorbed. It's when those adaptations mm. happen and you've got to allow that to happen. Don't be afraid to have a lazy day on the couch. And sleep is so important. A lot of the best rest and recovery comes free. Um, yeah. You know, sleep and uh, diet, I suppose, isn't free, but it's things you can control quite well. Um, but yeah, people are often looking for supplements to to help with recovery. And some can and some people need supplements. But I believe you should always see supplements as a supplement. That's exactly what they are. Go to the best basic things first, which are good diet, healthy and balanced, looking after yourself, as you said, and, and sleep is just such a good recovery method. Yeah, and I think people miss those, what we call the basics, but actually are the big basics, but people miss them out and they look for these trends of like these oils and all sorts to put in the body and you're like, 
that that's a one percent but you're not doing everything else so that's not really going to help no. you because you're not doing the basics that you could be doing so just try it. and it's boring people people don't do it because thinking about the basics can be quite boring but do those and it, you'll see the massive difference in your training and, and performance yeah and now we're just going to sell an oil to you and perform- <laughs> no. i'm only kidding i'm only kidding well i think we've covered a lot there yeah i'm, I'm really happy with that and um you know we do uh we do 5k sessions quite regularly we have coaching clinics which if you want to come and try some of our sessions uh, i'm sure we'll have a 5k session thrown in there at some point but i wouldn't become too bogged down with having a specific session all the time for for 5k but like i say we've got some coaching clinics coming up in the near future uh we, we do coaching clinics in london there's one coming up but first no first is london and then we've got loughborough to follow do you want yeah. to give the dates of those Gemma? Yeah, so London is the 26th of, what month are we in? April. April. <laughs> 26th of April on a Friday um, at the London um, Olympic Community Track. So we will be down there. You can sign up from um, via our website. Just sign up. It's completely free. I don't remember the date of the Loughborough one, but we will put some of the links um, below in the show notes, it's, as they say. It's the end of May. <laughs> um, I don't want to go exact, but it is the end of May at Loughborough Track. You can come and join us for free for a coaching session, expert coaching on your doorstep, hopefully, if you're local uh, we had one recently in manchester which was brilliant really enjoyed that uh, we also in manchester have the manchester marathon at the weekend we are doing a social shakeout run uh teamed up with Rafa. You can get a free coffee at the Rafa store if you come and join us. It'll be a little 15, 20 minute shakeout run before before the marathon. But if you're not doing the marathon, don't worry, you can still come along, say hello, come see the team. I will be there as well as a lot of our New Levels coaching team and the team at Rafa have kindly offered people that free coffee. So if you are in Manchester this weekend, come say hi around 10 o'clock in the morning. I'll be there for a little bit of a shakeout run. And if you are running a marathon, Manchester, Boston, London, any other marathon in the coming weeks, best Best of luck, but I appreciate there's going to be a lot of marathon talk over the next few weeks. We have an exciting episode coming to you before the London Marathon. So our next podcast episode will actually come out just before the the London Marathon. So it'll be slightly earlier than our two weeks that we usually put it out. So stay tuned for that. Promise you, you don't want to miss that episode. It'll be so, so good for you to watch, particularly if you're in London, and it'll get you a little bit excited for the London Marathon magic. In the meantime, best of luck with training and with races. Thanks again for joining us. We will see you all again very, very soon.